Okay, welcome back everybody. I'm going to try and speak up because the acoustics are a little difficult in this room. Uh, so our next speaker is Maria Vlasu. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Twente, also has affiliations with Eindhoven University of Technology and the European Research Institute, URANDOM. Uh, her research centers on performance of stochastic processing interacting networks, including those related to energy, high-tech manufacturing, cellular networks involved in insulin signaling. We should talk about that later. Yes. Uh, paper just came out. <laughs> great. Um, Maria's received best paper awards uh, from various organizations, including the Marcel Newt Student Paper Award and also the UPS George D. Smith Prize of Informs uh, on behalf of uh, Technical University, which she uh, was project coordinator and lead contact. She's currently associated with four operations research type journals. And in addition, uh, she represents the Netherlands at the European Women in Mathematics and Committee for Ma Women in Mathematics of the International Mathematical Union and is a board member of the Dutch Women in Mathematics Network since 2017. Please join me in welcoming her as she's going to talk about Brownian fork join cues. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if I've learned one thing in uh, my career so far is to try to get my nerves out immediately. So rather than start with the mathematics, let's get out my nerves. I finished the slides two hours ago. Um, and I started them 8 p.m. last night. Apologies for any typos. <laughs> that is my the thing that is keeping me right now with high adrenaline. Um, but I flew from Greece yesterday to the Netherlands and then here. So it's been a rather packed day. Having said that, let's try to do some math. Now, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present my work. It's actually the work I view as that of my PhD student rather than mine. That is the second part of NERVS, feeling uncomfortable talking about the work that your student has done. I'm uh, Maria Vlasiu. My name is a challenge to anybody non-Greek. And uh, I am only working in the University of Twente since uh, January this year. Yes, Eindhoven, it's been 20 years. I've been known for that, but now it's past. Now, as you see, we're talking about Brannion fork join cues, and that is joint work with uh, Miriam Meyer, who was a PhD student at Industrial Engineering, uh, Dennis Cole, my own PhD student, Willem van Jarsveld, the supervisor of Miriam, and Beth Swart, uh, who was co-supervising with me, uh, Dennis. Um, no excuses other than the last minute uh, delivery of slides, why I have only two pictures rather than uh, four, uh, but this is Dennis, just uh, when he uh, did his uh, thesis. And the work of Dennis was based on a project, on a grant that we got called the Complex Teen High-Tech Manufacturing from uh, the Dutch Research Council with uh, a couple of companies in the consortium and several universities trying to deal with complexity in supply chains. Okay, so um, as Ruth said, I work on networks of networks, interacting networks, pet peeves, since I have an audience and I have you captive for 60 minutes, I've heard so many times in my career that networks of networks do not exist and it is uh, something that I imagine and it should be just one network uh, with constraints, but that's not the case. Um, and supply chains, they, they are quite complex um, because you have suppliers, but they have their own suppliers and they have their own suppliers and that creates a lot of dependencies in the system. So what we did um, here in this project is we analyzed, particularly in this particular paper that I'm discussing with you today, uh, we analyzed a very specific news vendor problem. Now, uh, I have, I think, a mixed audience. Some of you uh, teach news vendor problems. Some of you are like, refresh my memory. But it comes back from uh, uh, selling newspapers. You have a vendor. He needs to sell newspapers. So he has some goods to sell. And um, they do not know beforehand how much demand they are going to face. But they do get newspapers fresh in the morning. And newspapers are obsolete at the very end of the day. Okay, so we need to get rid of that. And now the question that this person needs to answer is like, how am I going to maximize my profit? If I get too many newspapers in the morning, that means that I put down money in order to get them. I may lose money because there was not enough demand. But if I don't buy enough newspapers in the morning in order to sell, then I might lose money because I could not satisfy demand. Okay, so what we did is we managed to model um, the supply chain from high-tech manufacturing as a particular news vendor problem 
uh, and approximate the solution, which is what we're talking today. So the problems that we deal with um, pertain to high tech. They have multiple components, and these components are delivered by independent suppliers. I'm not going to I have a long introduction in operations research, but as I clearly motivate the problem from an OR perspective, let us spend a couple of slides there. So high-tech industry is um, characterized by very large supply chains. And in the project, we were collaborating with a company called ASML. Uh, if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, they make machines that are called lithographers. Lithographers are the machines that make chips. So Samsung, for example, needs these machines. And there are only two companies in the world that uh, make such machines. And one of them is in Eindhoven. And uh, one such machine, like an average price, is about 100 million for the basic model. Just to give the order of the problem, to understand what we're talking about, right? And ASML has a production line, Secrets Here, saying that produces two machines per week. Sometimes, if push comes to shove, they manage to produce three. And they cover about 80% of the global market in these machines. Okay. Now, ASML suppliers, they have a large supply chain. What does large supply chain mean? The direct suppliers of ASML are about 600. Here on this map, I just put the dots, not me. I took it from them, of their Dutch and German suppliers. So this is the Netherlands, and this is Germany. And a dot is financial volume, okay? But ASML monitors their suppliers eight levels deep. So they know their suppliers, of their suppliers, of their suppliers, of their suppliers, and that is more than 10,000 companies worldwide in order to produce one such machine. Now, we visualized only some of them, and you see the financial thing. What is interesting is that, now we're gonna talk about that in a second, that these suppliers, of course you can separate them in, uh, in, in high technology suppliers and low technology suppliers, but I'm going to ignore all low technology suppliers in this situation. We're talking about people that are making severely specialized equipment. That means that your usual mitigation strategies that you have in industrial engineering, such as how about some other supplier that could do it. If you have a problem, maybe I'll go to your competitor. That's impossible. Okay. So for example, this dot here is producing the lenses that zoom the laser, right? And that's uh, Carl Zeiss in Germany. And uh, you see how much lens is cost by the size of the dot. Um, spending time for a minute just because, you know, you're trying to get your nerves and get into a rhythm. I visited ASML and I saw something that uh, was pure gold and it was what I would call a fruit bowl. It was something like that and it was a concave thing and it really looked like a fruit bowl and it was in a display. And um, that was uh, the, the bowl, it was cracked, so it was not uh, longer functional. That's why it was on the display. That is the bowl, it's approximately like that, where the laser goes and goes and builds, it burns a chip that's like tinier or tinier than that. That fruit bowl costs more than a million, not because gold costs more than a million for this uh, volume of gold, right? For a thin fruit bowl. But because if that bowl was the size of Germany, the highest mountain on that Germany would be three millimeters. It's smooth, okay? So the difficulty with these supply chains is when um, they face delays, they're highly specialized, that is the thing that I made, and uh, when they face delays, everything stops. You cannot assemble your final machine. There is no backup, there is nothing else. As a consequence, the backlog that the manufacturer faces is your slowest supplier. So let's start thinking math. Now you see that there is some min max thing playing in here in, in the story that I'm having. Okay, so now we have questions that the manufacturer would like to understand. One of these questions is, is how slow is the slowest supplier? Can you quantify their performance, performance evaluation, okay? Um, and then the second uh, question that they're interested in is, how can we reduce our costs, our backlog costs? Now, what could uh, somebody do to reduce their backlog costs? Maybe they could invest in spare parts. Could you please sort of build up some stock, basic stock, so as to have something to take care of the variants, okay? Or maybe we could invest in capacity. Maybe we can, uh, for our suppliers or the suppliers, should, we should incentivize them to have more machines so as to supply as fast. And these two are two competing measures. If you worked in industrial engineering, you will know that the literature deals with one or the other measure, but optimizing for them concurrently, that is rather hard. And that is what we're doing in this work. 
Okay. Now, during this talk, I want to discuss with you a mathematical model based on fork join queues that represents this uh, supply chain. And we're going to try to answer these questions. I'm not going to put any attention in risks, but I've made the slides, so they're there. So we're going to put five seconds. Supply chains are very, very fragile, in particular when you have highly specialized people and the types of risks that you have may be external, such as the volcano that happened, I think, in about 2010. And it cost a few billion because the supply chains were disrupted for a week. Uh, but you can have um, trade wars, as you know, this country does not give this material or whatever. You can have sp supplier specific risks. And it's not only ASML just because it was in Eindhoven, but you can think about Boeing as another company that faces same difficulties. Okay. This slide, the only reason that it happened is because it's about two kilometers from my house. It's literally next to my house. There was a company, ProDrive, that supplies something to ASML. And there was a fire. It was extinguished within 15 minutes. And it cost ASML 340 million in the first quarter uh, because the clean room got dirty. Right. So risks exist. And there are supplier-specific risks. OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand the backlog of the process based on fork join queues. Now, the delays that suppliers may face, uh, we view them as a stationary process. We jump right into it. Why do we, they have delays? Because suppliers face delays, because the production is not deterministic. Okay. But the demand also, and supplier, you can, I did say that ASML produces two machines per week. So that seems like a pretty deterministic, very heavily loaded system. But there is also some stochasticity in demand, in particular when people believe that a new model is coming out. We analyzed both situations for deterministic and stochastic demands. Okay. Other characteristics that we have is that suppliers work independently from one another. So the company that provides this amazingly smooth fruit bowl that in Germany would have no mountains is completely different than the company that provides lenses. Um, and the other thing is that suppliers deliver only after getting an order. Even if they have a backlog of products, they start producing and they deliver only after an order comes. So you have a system where you have orders coming in, which triggers all the suppliers, the 10,000 of them, to start producing. Okay. Now, the approximation for this audience is like, ah, Maria, you just put a bullet there and you just jumped to pay in 20 pages of math. That is true, but I've done the math um, and I can uh, uh, quantify it. Is we assume now that we're dealing with a system that is already in steady state and heavy traffic, but we've done our limits beforehand. Okay. Now, how good are those assumptions? Sorry, what? How good are those assumptions? How good are excellent yeah, assumptions? Steady state, steady state Other than having proven them? Uh, they are excellent, and we're going to even, yes, and uh, you, you should do it in, in these supply chains, and uh, we've done even the numerics to support it. Um, our first, so here's the end of the talk. You can fall asleep after that, but here's the thing. Um, we use a diffusion approximation eventually to uh, do the joint optimization, and the convergence rate is so abysmally bad. That's the thing, that uh, using this diffusion approximation gives you a 10% uh, deviation from optimal costs. You can't simulate the system because you're doing two limits. You're doing the maximum over suppliers and the limit of time. So I need the maximum of the supreme of a Brownian motion. You can't simulate that. Okay. Um, however, we improve that approximation by using a mixed approximation between deterministic and stochastic. And that comes on average half a percent with the worst case 2% of optimal costs. So that's the answer. Sorry, I jumped the whole talk, but that is the, the summary. But yeah, since we're here, yeah, but since we haven't slept yet, this is a good point to just put it down, right? So it's a good thing to do. Now, if you know fork join queues, skip that. If you don't know fork join queues, let's have a look at them. Um, so a fork join queue, we typically represent uh, um, fork join queues, uh, queues with uh, circles for servers and uh, these rectangles for, for the queue part. And the picture is made by my student. Forget the circle that is here. It's not the server, it's the arrival process. So you have a system where you have a lot of queues, more than one, okay? And it could be 1,000 for all I care. Or if you're ASML, 10,000. And what happens is you have an arrival stream. Somebody wants a machine, a lithographer. And once this job arrives to the system, I would like a machine, this is being distributed among all your suppliers so that everybody produces their own part, okay? So they start working on this part. It's at their own time. They are ready. And they deliver to the warehouse this component that they're making. Some of them may be late, and once they are done, we can then assemble the machine. Okay, 
So the first part where you split up things, this is what we call the fork. And eventually when you assemble it, is, that is what we call the join part. And that is what we call a fork join part. And the important thing here is that everything is triggered by this common arrival process. So contradistic that with the independent arrival process where things would be coming independently and all these queues would be independent of one another. And these are single server queues and we would be able, or multi-server queues, it doesn't matter, but they're independent. So we would know everything about them, okay? Now, you can easily see how this ties to the ASML and risks and volcanoes that I was just uh, discussing, that the arrival stream of the manufacturer is the arrival process that we consider in this queuing system. And the backlog of suppliers, what they have not done, sorry, I apologize, is uh, how many items they have in their queue, because they may have an order for two, three, four things and they haven't done them, okay? Uh, while the assembly of components is the joint part later on. And as we are interested in the backlog of the system, we're thus interested in the slowest of the suppliers. So we're interested in some maximum Q length, right? So we're now in extreme value theory. And um, anything else? No, N is large here. Okay, and extreme value theory for independent random variables is something that we all understand very, very well. But the key word here is independent. And I wish to combine extremes with limiting processes, and they sort of don't go the same way. And the extreme value theory that I want to do is for dependent random variables. So that is an added complication in the thing. Okay. Now, as I said, the whole difficulty in analyzing fork join queues lies in the fact that the servers have the same arrival process, so there is dependencies. And the queue lengths are thus dependent random variables because of the common arrival process, okay? And what do we know for fork join queues in the literature so far? This is not a complete list, but the complete list is not bigger than that. It's not much bigger than that. For exact results, there exist some old results for two servers. That's what we know for exact results. And for approximations, there exist some approximations. I mentioned two of them there uh, for very particular models, but they're also very, very rare, okay? So we have some approximations, nothing for exact beyond that. And that's for join queues literature, okay. So what are we going to do for the rest of the talk? Since we want to know the backlog of the slowest supplier in the frog join queue, we want to measure the performance of the longest queue, okay, maximum queue length. And thus, I will present some results on the longest queue as n goes to infinity, as the number of queues that I have goes to infinity. Now, in earlier work, we had already proven a steady state and fluid limit, the first order convergence result. I'm just going to put it on the slide, but we're not going to work through that. And what we're going to discuss today is the second order convergence result. We're going to use modified extreme value theory just because we need to deal with the dependencies in there. Okay. And then afterwards, we're going to define here a news vendor problem where we want to minimize the expected costs with respect to the inventory and capacity. The inventory I had not visualized on the slide because I found too many numerics, but you may be considering that every supplier may be having some stock at hand, some basic, basic stock. Okay some inventory. Now, um, we did find some uh, um, symbolic expression for the optimal capacity and optimal inventory, and that's very, very hard to handle. So what we then do is we use our previous second order result. We use that in order to approximate the problem and solve thus the news vendor problem using the second order convert result that we have for the use as the expression to optimize for. And thus what we then do is we prove the convergence which relates to that question of our approximation based on the second order results to the optimal costs. Okay, now let's move to the model. Um, so uh, we assumed thus that all servers work independently and they're identical. The identical part, uh, in some parts, uh, we have relaxed it. So identical means that they have the same speed of working and if they have an inventory at hand, they have the same inventory, but these things I can relax later on, okay? The second thing that we have assumed is that they work in heavy traffic and we will analyze the system in steady state. Heavy traffic plus steady state means that we can use the usual representation for the queue lengths in steady state. So we say that for the ith supplier, the steady state queue length of that supplier can be written, written, can be written as a diffusion approximation is uh, some brand in motion minus a drift term. And the brand in motion that you see here has two parts. Uh, WI is the service process of the i server. They have their own service process. And WA is the common arrival process. 
So these are brown emulsions with a standard deviation sigma and sigma alpha. Okay. Now, the first convergence results in some other paper that I'm not presenting today here. Um, we had proven steady state and we had proven a, fa um, um, a fluid limit. Uh, we showed that the longest Q length uh, scales uh, as the logarithm in the number of servers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am saying like, Maria, there are negative numbers there and how does it work and everything? And it does relate to the question, but surprisingly also for me. So it's good. It's a common assumption in industrial engineering and it has been, yes, it is. How you, your, dif your difficulties with the negative numbers, right? Yeah. Yes, and you're saying what on earth is a negative interival number? Nonetheless, as a limiting process, coming to this slide that I was, it can be shown that uh, it provides excellent approximations. So you're, you, you say that I can't tie with it with a physical interpretation, and what I'm saying is it is the correct limiting process, right? So, <laughs> tough? Okay. Um, now, the maximum Q length, as I was saying, um, is um, converges, uh, divided by the log n, by the number of servers, converges to a standard deviation of the service process, yeah? Um, squared divided by two times Vita, and that is the drift term Vita, which relates to the speed that everybody's working, okay? Um, I know that there is a second line here, which you see it is for transient times. I know that it has uh, parameters like this alpha here that I did not explain, so I'm skipping it. I just want there for completeness that we also have things for transient times but this was for nearly deterministic systems and they were even for transient times. But let's focus on the first result that we're going to use today. Okay. Um, I did not put the proof because that's the old paper, uh, but um, only in four bullets, if we used uh, extreme value theory to prove that. And uh, the problem is the maximum of dependent random variables. So what we did is we separated the arrival process from the service process. The service process are independent, okay? Um, and we used lower and upper bounds. So plus and epsilon here, minus and epsilon there and you sandwich the maximum Q length between these two processes. Um, so what you know is that the supreme of a brown motion is an exponentially distributed, and now I have the maximum of exponentially distributed things, so that goes to Gumbel distribution, right? So constant times uh, log n converge to Gumbel distribution. So as n goes to infinity, um, these limits both converge to what I've shown you, the sigma square divided by two uh, vita plus or minus an error term, and what we see in here is that the arrival process does not play a role in the limit. So the limit is too rough, okay, as a first order approximation. So this leads to the natural question whether there would be some other uh, second order term that does depend on the arrival process, which is the second order re result that we're discussing here. And the answer is yes, when you subtract the previous limit that we've just seen of the first order, like of the law of large numbers type of uh, thing, and you scale by the square root of log n, then this will converge to a constant that involves the variance of the arrival process times a, a normal di distribution, normally distributed random variable with mean zero and the variance depending on both variances. Okay. Um, give me a second. Uh, I'm like halfway and I'm not doing well on time. How do we go about this? Uh, apologies for having a heuristic idea and the proof, but the, the, the idea of how you're going to go about that is. So the maximum of n supreme of brown motion, so with uh, 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 drift uh, vita, uh, scales like this, okay? And what we also know is that the conditional expectation of the first heating time of a brown motion to a point x is that point x divided by uh, the drift. So in this case, it is the vita. So by combining these two ideas, we can um, uh, say that the maximum of n supreme of brown motions is approximately the same as the maximum of n brand emotions evaluated at the heating time and which heating time, the heating time given here. And if you add to the story the arrival process and you can actually take it out, you can see uh, that uh, um, the, uh, you evaluate the arrival process at that heating time A and you can see that it can be written as a constant, this one, times the uh, uh, log n times uh, some uh, standard normal. And that explains the, the denominator and the limit that we're getting, okay? Now, uh, the actual proof, um, I got stressed by the time, so I see that I speed it even, uh, uses again this uh, heuristic idea 
that the supremum is taken at that heating time t. Okay. Um, so I will not explain the proof, but the short summary is for a lower bound that we're interested that we are evaluating the brand motion at that heating time t. And it uh, emerges that uh, this term on the left converges to zero. So anything that has WA and thus you're left with only this term. Okay. And for an upper bound, what we do is we use the union bound. So for any supremum, you can write it as three suprema over appropriate intervals. And thus, as a result, the tail probability that you need is uh, bigger than the sum of all these three things. And you can find that two of them go to zero and you're left only with the other one. Okay. Um, and and uh, you're getting a quantile of the normal function and you're happy. Now, these are not trivial statements. I rushed through them. You have a question, a sentence? Yes. Servers, correct. Yeah. Um, and these are not trivial statements because we're doing maximum of dependent random variables here. Uh, so there is a lot of work that takes place in order to show these limits, okay? But this is the basic idea, okay? Now, um, right on time, I would say this was the first part, which shows uh, a diffusion limit for the maximum Q length, which is the backlog of the process, okay? And the second part, what we do is we use these to optimize the system. So can we reduce cost or maximize profits by... I don't know, uh, having spare parts or regulating capacity, so playing with a Vita or having a base stock inventory. Now, in order to answer that, there are three variables uh, that you need to sort of think about in order to define your news vendor problem. So first of all, you have the backlog of the suppliers. Uh, second, you have maybe some base stock inventory uh, level that you have there. And finally, you have uh, to, to think about the speed that everybody's working with, okay? And of course, there are assumptions as usual. Um, one of the assumptions is that suppliers work on demand. So suppliers try to satisfy the demand by producing components, and they will only use spare parts if they have a backlog, okay? And uh, then the second part is that uh, when you finish a component, you're just simply storing it. Now, the backlog per supplier, um, there is a discrepancy, which I observed, say, an hour ago, but it was too late to change things. I, I, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Is that um, we flip between Q lengths and delay, but it's the same thing. As you see, it's the supreme of the brown motions that we had here, okay? So forgive me my D. Sometimes it's a Q, okay? Um, so the backlog per supplier equals this diffusion approximation of the Q length in steady state. And we denote them by D with argument Vita, where Vita has to do with a drift, or in other words, the speed that your servers are working. Um, we do make the simplification that uh, suppliers are identical. So namely, they have the same base stock level, I, and speed Vita. And as I did say, we have extended that to heterogeneous uh, servers. But you can definitely prove better math if you can have them homogeneous, OK? And thus, we will optimize the sum of all costs in the system. So this is a centralized optimization problem. You need to look at our last paper for the decentralized problem where every supplier is trying to improve their own bottom line. Okay? And then we have a Stalkelberg game. So here we don't do the decentralized problem with everybody on their own. We are improving the costs in the system. Now, what are the costs in the system? There are three types of costs that are made for this production process. So first of all, people have holding costs. Anything that they put in the warehouse has costs that they need to do. Um, the backlog of the manufacturer is equal to the backlog of the slowest supplier. And it doesn't matter what are the backlog of other people are. So uh, the backlog uh, in, in this particular example is the backlog cost of two products that are using server two, uh, because this is the supplier that has most jobs in the queue. Okay, so we have backlog costs. And then last, we have capacity costs. If you speed up your work or the number of words that you produce per second, that costs something, okay? So each supplier makes holding costs and capacity costs, but backlog costs are only made by the slowest supplier, okay? Um, this is the part that um, I always need to wrap my mind around. And um, I do hope that you do not have detailed questions because then I'll start talking about three and five, trying to, to match the math, but it is 
what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to count objects in the warehouse in order to write my cost function. That's all I'm going to do. So skip the graphics, take the uh, cost function at the very end if you like. Now, initially, each supplier has the same number of base stock level of spare parts, but this is not the number of components where you have holding costs. That's your baseline, okay? You have holding costs for the things that you have produced and you put in your, the warehouse. And items may be added to the warehouse because, you know, suppliers produce things or uh, items are being taken um, to resolve delays. So what you could have is two situations. Either the inventory that everybody has is um, enough for the backlog of the system. And as a result, there will be no backlog at the very end. And now what I want to do is like, okay, so how, what is the inventory of every supplier? Um, so the number of uh, products that are left in stock is what they had minus what they have been used, but in between they had been producing. So uh, the finished components waiting for the assembly is the backlog of the system minus the delay that every supplier has. And adding these two things up, you end with total stock, which is the initial stock that they had minus their own delay, okay? That is the part that went too fast. I recognize that, but this is just adding, you know, what if I is three and this is five, that's the wrong thing. If this is five and this is three and I had one inventory, et cetera, et cetera, it, it is just basic arithmetics and it always confuses me. Okay. The other case is where the inventory that you have is less than the maximum delay, which means that you are going to end up with some um, a backlog at the very end. And all the spare parts are going to be used in order to cover this delay. And thus you're going to have in zero in stock. And thus, uh, what suppliers are going to be having in stock is this maximum delay minus their own delay. Um, basic arithmetics that I know I went too fast mean that you can actually compute what is the stock of everybody, knowing this information. Uh, this slide is junk, so let's try again. That was true. Okay. So, in the thing that I went too fast is that supplier has that many items in stock. Okay. Um, so we have an expression, let's say, where I am, I'm here, okay. Uh, the system has its own backlog, so maximum backlog minus what was an inventory. The holding costs are the holding costs of the first expression because they're per supplier. The backlog costs are the backlog costs of the system backlog. And the capacity costs for speeding up servers are represented by Vita, which means that the total loss cost in the system is for everybody holding costs, for everybody capacity costs, and for the slowest supplier backlog costs. Plug all these things in, you have an expression which you can simplify a little bit. Okay. Now, that's the problem we need to minimize. Yeah. In order to find the optimal number of spare parts and optimal capacity, so optimize for I and optimize for Vita, we want to minimize the expected costs over the inventory capacity, as I've just said. And the majority of the literature, you deal with either one problem or the other problem, but not the joint optimization. Okay. There are some notable exceptions, and I've put uh, three of them on the slide, but uh, they're very rare. Okay. So let's see. As you see in this cost function, um, what we have is uh, Vita is in the argument of the delay here. And what you can do is uh, the delays are random variables. So it seems like complicated, but what you can do is you can write in more convenient. You can use the self-similarity property of the brand motion in order to write uh, the term that you have here as the supremum of a brand motion with drift vita equals one, okay? And you need to rescale also the inventory in order to do that, okay? Um, so this is just one over vita uh, times a function that effectively depends on i plus vita n, okay? So it has this basic form. And that allows you to write this as two optimization problems, two separate optimization problems. You can optimize first for the inventory and then for Vita. So you can decompose the problems. So let's start by optimizing. This is nothing. This is just the F expanding it out. Okay. So let's start optimizing the inside part, the optimizing for inventory. Now this is convex. So it can be shown that it can become can be shown to be convex. So optimizing is easy. Take derivatives, set them to zero, and find what's your optimal point. Okay. And it turns out that you end up with a quantile function of the maximum delay, the maximum queue length. So you're having the quantiles of the maximum queue length evaluated at a certain point. Okay. 
Now that you have the symbolic expression for your optimal inventory, then you can go to the other optimization problem. You can plug in that optimal point. And it's not hard to minimize that problem now too, which ends up with another symbolic expression for the optimal speed of working, okay? And if you do the math, you will see that in optimality, backlog costs plus holding costs equal to capacity costs, or in other words, the optimal costs in the system are twice the capacity costs. And I, I've done the math, I, I, can, I can take a derivative, a first derivative and, and put it to zero, but I have no intuition why that would actually work like that in the system, okay? So it turns out like this, but I don't know why it is true. Okay, so, so far what we have done is we found symbolic expressions uh, for the optimal inventory and optimal capacity levels, uh, but can we have convergence results as n goes to infinity, okay? And the whole difficulty now lies in this um, maximum delay, have I highlighted? No, I haven't highlighted. In this maximum delay term uh, in the system, which is the maximum of dependent random variables. Uh, time, we're good in time, okay. So we still have to do some work and then um, we are going to use the second order convergence results of the maximum two lengths that we have just found out in order to get an understanding on the convergence properties of this news vendor problem uh, as an approximation. So thus we replace this maximum by the limit that we had gotten previously whether it is for deterministic arrivals, where they converge to gamble, so the maximum of supreme of grand motions, maximum of exponentials gamble. Um, this is just plugging in the expression to look what we're looking like, or for stochastic arrivals, where it is essentially pre-constant with a normal random variable. So you plug this into the system. Okay. Now, uh, this approximation gives us that the approximate inventory is a scaled version of the quantile function of the standard normal random variable, for example, for the stochastic case. And that gives us an idea about how the optimal inventory looks like. It will scale with uh, sigma squared um, uh, over uh, two log n, right, with beta. Uh, but we also, the, uh, we estimated the real quantile function with uh, uh, the student, and we compared it to the approximation by using simulations. And um, for reasonably large n, let's say 1,000, we did not see any convergence. So great idea, but no convergence. So that means that for realistic number of suppliers, we don't have convergence. And the reason that this happens is because the second order convergence result is too slow. So what we had to do is, I'm skipping through, is it was 10 to 10, 15% off, right? And it's asymptotically correct, but it's not useful. So what we had to do is we had to take a small step back and we looked at a slightly simpler problem uh, where we examine now what happens if arrivals are independent because that's an easy system to analyze, okay? So what you do is you forget about the correlations of uh, the brand and motion term, the WA term. And we try to do the same analysis. And uh, you can see that uh, we use the most basic uh, uh, result that you have for extreme values, and then that leads to optimal um, approximations. Optimal, sorry, to, that leads to better approximations. Okay, so we use that. So we, we use this system, okay? Now, give me a second because I spoke so fast and so much in order to make it in time that I lost my, my, my rhythm right now and I'm trying to finish in four minutes and I'm seeing four slides, so it should be good time for questions. But uh, let's take a deep breath, at least I need to do, and say, you write the news vendor problem, you uh, manage to decompose it in two things, separate the independent parts, uh, you have symbolic expressions and it involves the maximum Q length, uh, great. So you plug in your second order approximation and Simulation of that thing is horrible uh, as the maximum of supreme of ground motions, uh, but we did the work and then the convergence even for 1,000 servers is amazingly slow and you're 15% of optimum, okay? So in order to improve that, you interpolate it between a deterministic system and your stochastic system, which is a standard technique that you're doing. And that, for the same problem, comes uh, on a 2% worst case scenario from optimal values that you have computed. That's the basic idea. At least the basic idea without stressing, I can put it throw forward. And what happens in this slide is, uh, this is the part where you ignore the dependence coming from the joint arrival process. Okay. Um, 
So coming here, we uh, managed to prove a convergence result of the optimal inventory and the optimal capacity and the optimal costs. And we were even actually able to prove convergence rates now, OK? So the difference between the um, optimal inventory, let's say I'm here, sorry. Uh, the difference between the optimal inventory, OK, an approximate inventory, and the difference uh, between the optimal capacity and approximate capacity uh, uh, go to uh, 0, like 1 over polynomial, OK? Only the difference between the optimal costs and the approximate costs converges slower to 0, OK? Now, so we get that um, the optimal inventory scales with log n. The optimal capacity scales with the square root of log n. And um, the, second, uh, um, um, the second term in the optimal inventory is the quantile function of a Gumpel function. OK? Um, so to conclude, the optimal strategy here is to cover almost delays, almost all delays. Try to cover almost all delays. And the reason is that we have two quantities that both cannot get too large uh, because of the factor B that we had for the backlog costs. Uh, the mass lies on this quantity uh, on, on the right, OK? So if you would set B to 0, uh, then it would be optimal to set the number of spare parts to 0, which is uh, clearly easy to say mathematically, uh, but it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever in real life, <laughs> OK? OK. So. Of course, I assumed in this problem that holding costs and backlog costs were constants. And these results will change if you give more weights to backlog or if you uh, st start taking scaled cost functions. Um, and if backlogs would go to zero, then it would be beneficial to not cover delays, which has no practical application, as I've just said. So we further simplified the problem by having people make the same decision for speed of working or inventory. Um, and that would be interesting also to investigate whether uh, these results or similar results hold when they make different decisions. That is one of the complaints that Terry had. So the paper includes a very extensive numerical study for heterogeneous servers. Okay. And long story short, still works. Okay. And then last, this is a centralized optimization result. So we optimize the costs in the system. So an interesting idea is to compare what would happen if you have and decentralized optimizations, one for every supply, okay? Who cares about their own personal incentives? And that we do in a paper that is under preparation. And um, covering all questions before you ask them, um, you can actually extend the second order result to general Levick processes. Um, can be done, we know that, but my student graduated. <laughs> so maybe if I find time at some point, I'll extend to Levick processes. OK, uh, so thank you very much for your attention. What I've done today is I uh, showed you very, very briefly uh, from the first paper, the uh, fluid and, and the steady state limit. OK, the papers are ordered not in the order that they were published, but the order that we worked through them. Uh, the second paper is the one that I tried at least to discuss with you today. Uh, what happened is I told you that convergence is very, very slow, which motivate us, motivated us to study tail asymptotics of this process uh, that had been published actually before the second one was true. And um, we did that uh, for um, uh, light tails and motivated by work of Morha Balter on uh, parallel processing in data centers, where she said that in such problems, you have a fork join queue, but uh, uh, the file sizes are typically heavy tailed and we don't know what to do that. Well, we did it. So we did that for heavy tailed now uh, jobs or service times. OK, so that is under revision, has been submitted. And last, um, in this story, a couple of times I said, what if people had their own incentives? Well, then it would be a game uh, played. And we formulated this problem as a Stackelberg game. And what we find, uh, it's in the title. But I can give you the preprint, because it's in a pretty good state. But it's not finalized yet, so it's not an archive. Uh, is that even for heterogeneous settings, um, symmetry is being forced. The system forces people to take the same decisions, even if they try to play their own game and optimize their own costs. I hope I didn't make uh, much of a soup. Thank you for your attention. At least uh, I worked through my nerves. This was it.
Thank you very much, Maria. Are there any questions from the audience here? Chris. It seems to me that in your introduction, uh, you gave an example of a concrete company, and then you said that they had lots of suppliers, and then suppliers of suppliers, and so on, and this was like eight levels or something, right? But then in when you presented your mathematical results, it seemed to me that all suppliers were independent. And they were all washed out by having some run and motion of arrivals and services, correct. So so there, were, there was no hierarchy of suppliers in your mathematical model, in, right? In that one, we took only the first level suppliers and what you say in the layered uh, network, that is what I'm doing with another system, uh, with another student right now. Because there are two ways, at least simply put, of how to model dependencies. And one is people impose some external dependency between quantities and say it has some form, whether they use uh, copulas or whether they say their joint distribution has this form. And the other one is through structure, which is what I'm doing uh, by having um, an interacting network. But then the problem is, how do you model the interactions? Like, how do you model a signal triggered from one level to the other level? So there is, again, a modeling approximation that you're making there, and I don't know which is better. I just do it through structure. However, you're absolutely right. In this presentation, uh, we discussed the fork join queue, and we did not put the other layers. If you think to approximate something with your model, uh, what is the typical value of N capital on practice? As I've said, for ASML, if you take the first order high volume suppliers and high, I think it's 600. And if you so take- So N is 600. And if you take, uh, yeah, and if you take all suppliers, it's 10,000. Anybody else? question you didn't ask is, did they use these results? And my answer is, that's why I had the industrial engineers there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Plus the whole backlog costs that were tripping me. Uh, so I have a question. I seem to remember that Vien Nguyen had some work on fork join queues that had a reflecting brown motion as an approximation. Is there sort of like a network version of this that might be related to that? Or I don't know if a network version of fork join queues. Uh, okay. But that would be interesting, and that would also be interesting as an idea to model the question that we've just gotten. Right. How would you like to go? Yeah. So who? Wait. Uh, Vien Nguyen. I'll, I'll Vien give Nguyen. you the reference. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. A network of work joint. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Here. Okay. You'll going, go. going. No. Gone. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria. Done. <laughs>